So, what's next? We've got Jeff Sutherland, the co-creator of Scrum here. Um, Jeff is phenomenal. Who has seen, who, who's been taught by Jeff? Anybody? Pretty awesome stuff. I've been um, really blessed to be part of five of his classes. Um, for some reason, I, I just keep going to his classes. I learn more and more every time I'm there. And it's just been a huge blessing to be part of that. Um, so a lot of people ask about Jeff and his background. And, and he'll go into a little bit of this. But I have to share with you, there's something special about Su Jeff Sutherland. You know, it's one of these moments when you're sitting back in the class and you hear someone talk about Jeff and one of uh, the other CSTs who works for Jeff was sharing Jeff's background. And um, you kind of pause. Here's a man who's a, a West Point grad, has done some amazing things uh, when he was at West Point, was a top gun fighter pilot, flew in missions, in missions where there's a 50-50 chance that he'd get back alive. A guy who ended up being a professor in medical school and who ended up getting a PhD and really having an amazing experience being able to produce um, white papers and case studies about cancer that's still being used today. In fact, one of the folks that works with me, she's studying medicine, she's studying to be a nurse. And she says, Jeff Sutherland, that just makes sense. She looked it up and sure enough, it was one of his papers that she was studying. Can you imagine that? And now he is you know, using all of this knowledge to build up Scrum. So when we talk about Jeff, Jeff is he's, he's way beyond process, right? He's way beyond that. And it's really um, a great opportunity for us to kind of soak that all in and, and learn from him. So today, my encouragement to you is hear what he has to say, his message. Um, think of really great questions. We'll have some time for a Q&A. And so uh, we'll, we'll be able to, 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 to get to that um, later, later this afternoon at the conclusion of, of his talk. But think about what is one question that you would have for Jeff Sutherland with all this great knowledge and foundational stuff that he's given to us from an Agile perspective. So with that, I'd like to hand over the stage to Jeff Sutherland. When I first uh, finished the book, uh, the French wanted me to do a TED talk on the book at Aix-en-Provence, and they, uh, they created this video uh, to start my session, which I thought was very interesting. think that Scrum is all about hacking the leadership. You know, they have this big cement block, we're going to take the organization, we're going to shatter it into small pieces, then we're going to take the work, we're going to break that into small pieces, we're going to take the time and we're going to break that into small pieces, and to do that we have to hack the minds of the leadership. And so that's that's what I've been doing. I have a small company now in Cambridge, right across the street from the MIT Business School, and we go around training, consulting. Uh, we have two journalists on staff, because one of our goals is to do a lot more publishing and uh, capture all the material that we've developed over the last 20 years, and also to push Scrum out into other domains. So Joe Justice uh, leads our hardware practice. And we have some very interesting things going on in the hardware space. But when I talked to the French, I decided I'd start with the Declaration of Independence because, <laughs> you know, General Lafayette came over and without him we might not have won the, the revolution. And so the French had a lot to do with making us the country that we are. And the Declaration of Independence says that everyone's entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, this has a lot to do with Scrum, because a lot of people, I noticed, don't have a life. <laughs> In fact, most people hate work. The only thing that's worse than going to work is being sick in bed. And uh, in software, most of us have a little better 
time and software, but for a lot of people, things are not so good. In fact, the New York Times did a, did a survey on why people hate work, and you know, people don't have regular time for creative thinking. They can't focus. Uh, they, they can't work on what they like to work on. They, they have no meaning or significance in the work, no connection to the company's mission, and on and on and on. And uh, I didn't realize how bad it was until I left medical school. I was hired away from medical school by a bank, and I went into the bank, and my God, I'm going to talk about what, what was going on in the bank. It was unbelievable. Uh, but my conclusion about why this is a problem is that people just can't get stuff done. You know, as the famous poet says, the best laid plans of mice and men, they often go wrong and you wind up with a lot of pain and suffering instead of the promised joy. And I learned firsthand about that as a plebe at West Point. Here I am, my first few months there in Beast Barracks. And after running around all day being yelled at by upperclassmen, before we could go to bed at night, we had to, uh, we had to go to a shower formation. And we sit outside the showers at attention, <clears throat> bracing hard enough to drench our bathrobes with sweat. And only when our bathrobe was drenched in sweat could we get in the shower. And so I had to learn how to generate twice the sweat in half the time. <laughs> That's what my book is about. <laughs> How to do this. <laughs> it's a famous photo because the guy in the middle there is General Barry, Barry McCaffrey, the four-star general, the most decorated guy in my class. He was in my squad at Beast Barracks. My last year there, they made me training officer of Company L2. And the, the training officer's job was, one of the job was to get the company really marching well in the formal parades. We had at least three a week. And there were 24 companies, and every company had a training officer grading every company. And the problem with L2 was they had been known for 100 years as the loose deuce because of their sloppy performance on the parade field. And no, no matter what we did, we had them marching overtime. We told them they were bad people because they weren't doing a good job. But nothing made them better. Finally, out of desperation, I started putting the scores from all the other training officers up in color-coded notes on the company bulletin board. So when they came back from a parade, everybody would have to walk by and see that you know, the number one problem was Charlie stuck his sword in the dirt in the middle of the parade field and we lost 10 points. Or the third platoon was not a line coming onto the field. Or the company commander did not articulate his commands clearly and precisely at the right moment. And to everyone's amazement, within three months, Company L2 became the number one marching company in the Corps of Cadets for the first time in 202 years. Wow. And what it showed was the power of making things visible, causing teams to self-organize. Right about that time, well, this is the biggest problem that we're seeing in most big companies. You know, scaling is a big issue now. I'm pulling it, pulled into a lot of large companies, and I find out they can't prioritize the backlog. Everything is number one priority. They've got 100 projects. They can't get anything done. And for some reason, they can't seem to fix it. So this is the number one problem. And there's an acceptance test for the prioritized backlog, and that means every team has a clear ordered backlog. For every sprint, they know exactly what they're doing. And during the sprint, no one comes in and steals any members of the team to throw them on another project. How many people are in that situation, meet the, that acceptance test? Nobody? This is mind boggling, OK? A lot of you are coaches. You've got to fix this. This is going to give all of us a bad name. Right about the time that L2 became the number one marching company in the Corps, one of our most famous graduates died. Uh, the year before, General MacArthur had given his farewell speech, which to, to this day, every cadet has to memorize. And it was a really powerful uh, talk. I was there. Uh, 
At the end of, by the end of his talk, there were 3,000 cadets in the mess hall at the time. Every one of them was crying, which was a rare thing for a cadet. So he was a tremendously inspirational figure. And he had specified when he died that there would be a company cadet of cadets that would march behind his casket and lay him to rest. And Company L2, because they were the number one in the Corps of Cadets, was chosen to bury General MacArthur. And none of us have ever forgotten that. I also learned some things from other great leaders who graduated from West Point. I, I slept in General Eisenhower's room when I was a cadet. There was a brass plate on the fireplace. I'd, office, the light would glance off it at night as I was going to sleep. And I'd wonder what General Eisenhower was thinking when he was lying there in that bed. <clears throat> I knew one of his most famous quotes was, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Before he launched the troops on the beach in D-Day, he did one of the biggest planning efforts ever in the history of the world. But he knew as soon as the first troops hit the beach, the plan would be shattered, and the teams would have to self-organize to win. And that's exactly what happened. I learned about this firsthand at, as a fighter pilot. When I graduated, I decided to win the Air Force and become a pilot. I was flying F-4 Phantom aircraft. Here's one of my fellow pilots getting shot down over Hanoi uh, by a SAM missile. Uh, you can see him actually bailing out of the plane. There's a little black spot below the plane. Uh, his parachute is about to open. When he landed, he was captured and thrown into the Hanoi Hilton, the, the prisoner of war camp in Hanoi. Uh, he was a pretty tough character. He escaped. Uh, he was recaptured and tortured to death. And that's what happened to uh, over half of the people that I flew with, something similar. Now, by the time I had uh, been there for a while, I had figured out that if you flew straight and level over a target over North Vietnam, it was the most heavily defended airspace in the history of aerial warfare, you were likely to get shot down. So when I crossed the border, I immediately went into an evasive maneuver and I never stopped until I got back across the border. I had a plan so I knew when I needed to be over the target, but only for a few seconds. Now, they asked me to train a lot of pilots during the latter part of the time I was there, and I noticed that if these pilots did not follow my instructions and started to follow their flight plan, 80% of them would get shot down. But if they went into an evasive maneuver, only 20% got shot down. So on, that was, on the average, about 50%. So when I got back from Vietnam, those kind of experiences uh, really, uh, I felt like I, I had hit the reset button. You know, all the things that used to be important were no longer important. I first felt kind of guilty getting back and all those other guys were still in the Hanoi Hilton or dead or buried in the mountainside. But then you feel exhilarated, like, thank God, it's a miracle I got out of there alive. But then, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? In fact, since the reset button has been pushed, it's a new life. I got life number two and I don't want to do what I did in life number one. So what's it going to be? I decided the Air Force, I, I owed the Air Force so many years of service for all the pilot training I had done, there was no way to get out of the Air Force. Uh, so I decided, hey, you know, they had a program, they would send pilots back to school, academy graduates back to school to become teachers at the Air Force Academy. So I said, hey, I'd like to become a professor of mathematics, send me to Stanford, I'll get an advanced degree, they agreed to do that. It gave me a lot of time to think. The courses I liked best at Stanford were actually in the medical school. I liked, I studied, I was studying probabilities, statistics, computer science, but I liked using math and statistics to run clinical trials and epidemiologic studies. Uh, so when I came back, when I came to Colorado to the Air Force Academy to teach, while I was teaching math in the daytime, nights and weekends and vacations, I started into a PhD program at the nearest medical school in Denver. There I met a, a very famous physician, D 
Dr. Baylor, I noticed during the last week, the MacArthur Awards were announced. That's where they come by and they say, here's a million dollars for being such a great person. Spend it however you want. <laughs> they used to give them to young people. I think Baylor is the only one that got one when he was over 80 years old. When I met Baylor, he had just published a, bit, a paper that it was causing a huge uproar in the medical community. He had shown in the paper that there were more women dying of cancer induced by radiation exposure from mammography than were being saved by early detection. And the radiologists were furious. They wanted to tar and feather him and run him out of the country. This week I noticed, uh, this is still rolling out until today, this week I noticed that the front page of Time Magazine, it, 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 it says, should I ever get screened or something? Because there's no improvement in lifespan by getting screened for breast cancer. Okay, these are hard statistics for people to swallow. But when I met Baylor, I had a lot of respect for him that he would state the truth and take the heat. They had to create a special blue ribbon panel at the National Cancer Institute that met for six months. And at the end of six months, they decided Baylor was absolutely right. They changed all the dosage standards, all the protocol, and so forth. So I said, you know, Dr. Baylor, you're a guy who writes stuff that people really read. They might not be happy about it, but they certainly read it. You know, I'm working on a PhD and most of us write a thesis, it winds up at a library shelf, nobody ever reads it. How about helping me write something useful that people will read? And he said, well, I, I have a few problems, he said, that I've been thinking about. Uh, here's 300 clinical papers and in every paper, it has charts and graphs on cancer. Some of them are dose response curves for carcinogens applied to rats, mice, rabbits, monkeys. Others are human cancers, all different types of cancers, cancer in all the different countries of the world. All of these charts and graphs are different. Explain why they're different and you'll get your PhD. He said, in order to do that, you're going to have to mathematically model how a human cell becomes a cancer cell. And nobody agrees on how this works. So we're gonna to have to figure out what causes cancer. And then when you model the cell, you're gonna to need to model the, the tumor growth. And then a, a patient appearing in a clinic and getting a diagnosis. Because then their data goes to the National Cancer Institute. I've been collecting data for 10 or 20 years and when your model of the human cell fits all my data, then you get your PhD. <laughs> it's a tough problem, but if you want to write something that's worthwhile, you should give it a shot. And he said, we'll help you. All the leading cancer researchers in the world are working with me trying to publish in my journal, and we'll have them review everything you're doing. So off I went. I spent six months studying the medical literature, trying to figure out how would you mathematically model this. And then another six months writing the first program. And when I ran it after a year, it used a third of the computer science budget for the entire medical school for the year for just one run. <laughs> I needed thousands. They told me I could never run that program again. <laughs> I had to spend the next two years trying to figure out how to get computer hardware into the medical school that I could run the program on. And, uh, but what the program clearly showed, is, which is what we see today, uh, this is data from a recent paper where you know, we can DNA sequence cells right now. We can see exactly what happens to a cell when it mutates. And it goes through a series of steps. You know, it might go off into leukemia, it might keep mutating, it might get to early solid tumors, it keeps mutating, it becomes a malignant tumor. It gets treated, treated with radiation chemotherapy and <clears throat> keeps on mutating and goes into a metastatic drug resistant tumor, okay? There's clearly four major states before it's malignant. That's what the program showed, even the very first run. But we had to get the 
the systems in that I could run on, and we decided to acquire two multiprocessor tandem systems. They had a unique architecture which enabled me to grab every spare cycle on every processor for the next five years without interrupting normal clinical computing. And I could put a run in on Sunday and by Friday it would run to completion. I was guaranteed it would run to completion because of the fault tolerant nature of the tandem systems. And after I had a thousand runs, I got my PhD. I spent another, uh, almost another 10 years at the medical school as a professor. I went into the department of radiology, which was my minor. Uh, became a professor of radiology, biometrics, and preventive medicine until a big bank came by one day and said, you know, Jeff, you are using technology that we're using for automated teller systems. And you guys have all the knowledge over at the medical school, but over the bank we have all the money. What if we put <laughs> the money together with the knowledge? It would be a perfect marriage. And they, they made me an offer that my wife couldn't refuse. <laughs> we wind, I wind up at the bank <laughs> as vice president for advanced systems. So I'm working away on their future strategies. But meanwhile, I'm, I'm looking at, they had hundreds of COBOL programmers. Do you still have those at Capital One? Yeah? They were all out there slaving away day and night because their projects were always late. And when they were late, the management would make them work overtime and weekends. They would send them on death marches. They, they remind me of Roman soldiers rowing galleons. You know, somebody's cracking the whip. Row harder. I went into the CEO of the bank and I said, you know, these guys out there, they're using GAN charts to run projects. And those GAN charts, they had ones that filled walls. Do you have those at Capital One? Thousands of tasks filling whole walls with project leaders running around all day trying to update them. And I said, you know, on the Gantt chart, every task has a, uh, a person and a date. And if anyone misses one of those dates, the whole thing slides to the right. And they're late. This is a prescription that guarantees lateness. I can't believe it. I said, I think I know how to fix this. Why don't you give me the worst business unit in the bank, and I'll show you how to straighten this out. The CEO thought about it for a couple of days, and finally he said to me, Sutherland, if you want this headache, you've got it. I said, I need everybody, sales, marketing, installation, support. And what I'll do is I'll run them like a little company within a company, and once a month, I'll present the financials to you and the management team, you guys can be my board of directors. The rest of the time, you stay out of my company, and I'll, I'll show you how to fix it. So he agreed to do that. So I got them together, split them into small teams, five or six people each, and I said, okay, what you guys need to do is learn how to land a project. You know, these Gantt charts remind me of training new fighter pilots. They come in for a landing and they're high. And if they land, they'll hit the middle of the runway and they could slide right off the end of the runway and create a big smoking hole when they hit the buildings or the trees. So what we're gonna do is show you how a good pilot lands an aircraft. Here's the plane that I used to fly. Some of these are still flying. You can notice he's making small Incremental changes every step of the way. Added, you know, angle of attack, airspeed, power setting, rate of descent, all of these things are being constantly adjusted. These planes are designed to be land on aircraft carriers, so they're slammed on the end of the runway to absorb a lot of the energy to slow them down. So here he is, he's coming in, perfect landing, bang, and then pops the drag chute. So I said, the way we're gonna work is on Monday, we're all going to build a backlog of things to do, prioritized by business value. And on Friday, everything's going to go live. We'll land the project every week. 
I know you'll have a tough time when the, the first couple of weeks, but with a little practice, you'll learn how to do it. <clears throat> and sure enough, that company became the most profitable business unit in the bank in less than six, six months. And the bank started investing millions and millions of dollars in it, upgrading the hardware, the technology, expanding the business. So what I did with the bank, with the bank was add the burn down chart. That's the pilot watching the glide path, bringing the plane in for a landing. So I was hired by a number of companies while well, the bank bought a, a technology company in Cambridge near MIT. They sent me out there to fix that. They were years late building a new technology banking system. And then I started to get pull in, pulled into other companies. And I started thinking about, well, we need to, we need to formalize this so that you know, I can't fix every company in the world. So how would we set it up so that other people could do this? <clears throat> I had some interesting models to, uh, to work with. Uh, one, of, one of my companies, I was running an object database company right in the MIT, MIT campus. And six graduate students walked down the street from the AI lab and said, we want to start a new scum company and we want to rent some space. You've got some lab space. How about renting it to us? They were building these insect like robots. So I said, well, it's pretty interesting technology. Why not? I got extra space. We'll make some money. So if they brought the robots in. And uh, every Friday, prof their professor would come by to see how they were doing, Professor Rodney Brooks. And one Friday, I said, Professor Brooks, explain to me how these robots work. Really interesting technology. And he said, well, he said, first you need to understand, for 30 years, we tried to build a smart system at MIT. It's been a total failure. The best we've been able to do is a smart chess program. Now we have Watson, right? It doesn't walk. It doesn't talk. So I've, I'm taking an absolutely, totally different strategy. This robot has a chip in a leg that knows how to move a leg. It has a chip in the spine that can coordinate legs. It has a neural network chip in the head that figures out what to do. He says, let me show you. The neural network chip is blank. When you plug it in and turn it on, all the legs start flopping like spaghetti. It wobbles to its feet, starts walking around banging into things. In a few minutes, it's running around the room. It even gets the stairs and it doesn't fall off the edge. It backs off. I said, wow, that's amazing. He said, yeah, it learns how to walk for the first time every time you turn it on. And I thought. You know, back at the bank, I had these really slow COBOL programmers. What if we gave them some simple rules like the robot, and every day they could get together and meet and synchronize their neural networks? Maybe they could boot up into a super fast, super smart team. About the same time, I was on the president's advisory committee of Oxion International, a micro, uh, enterprise, um, microfinance enterprise that was based on the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh that won the Nobel Prize for lending really small amounts of money to really poor people. We were lending money to, to poor people in South America that couldn't feed their children. And we get a team of five or six of them together. We talk about, OK, if we loaned you $25, how could you start a small business that would fund your family? And when everyone had a business plan, We'd loan them $25, and then we'd say, OK, we're going to meet regularly, and when you paid back your loan, we'll talk about how you can scale your business. We'll loan you another $25. And we got amazing results. Within a few weeks, a woman who couldn't feed her kids could feed the kids. Not only that, she had enough money left over to buy clothes. This was really important because they couldn't go to school without clothes. So now she has the kid in school. Her business starts getting better. She's saving money and starting to build a house. Within six months, she's got a new house. I went back to my software development team one day, and I said to them, you know, you guys remind me of the poor people in South America. You have shoes, but you have no software. You know, It's never ready on time. It always has too many bugs. Management says you're bad people. How long has this been going on? 
And every member of the team said, it's been going on as long as I've been in the business of software. I said, do you want to live the rest of your life like that? And they said, no. And I said, well, I have an idea. What if we used the knowledge we've gained with all these prototypes I ran of Scrum and the robot and Oxion, and we put it all together. I said, I bet we could deliver more software in six months, so much software, it would be the management and the customers would be like drinking from a fire hose. They would, they would ask us to please slow down, and then we could take back our power as people and regain our dignity and be in charge of our life and you know, work on improving our engineering practices and co instead of constantly being behind and under the gun. Do you want to try it? They said, yeah, what have we got to lose? Let's give it a shot. So off we went. Now as they're working, because I'm basically trained as an evolutionary biologist, okay? So I, had been, I was quite aware that at the time, Professor Jay Gould at Harvard was writing papers on punctuated equilibrium. And I was noticing that people working on the software, you know, they'd work for days, sometimes weeks, nothing would work, and then all of a sudden it would work and they'd be surprised. And I would say, guys, that's punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is, you know, species do not evolve smoothly. You know, squirrels run around this forest floor for a million years, and then all of a sudden one flies out of a tree. How did that happen? Well, at the time, one of the first supercomputer companies was Thinking Machines, right down the street from my office. And Denny Hillis, the founder, was simulating punctuated equilibrium on the highly parallel Thinking Machine. So he's doing the kind of evolutionary biology simulations that I was doing in medical school. And he's finding out that during that million years, that the, far, that the squirrel was running around on the forest floor, there were small changes going on in different parts of the system. You know, a little change, a little more skin under the, under the arm, a little more acuity in the eyesight, a little bit more strength in the shoulders, until all of a sudden one day, five or six different organ systems would change just enough to line up just right that whoa, the first squirrel flies. So I said, you know, you guys, when you're building software, you need to think about how you would take advantage of this effect. You need to look at the system as how it is, and instead of building a new feature and taking forever and not having it work very well, you ask, what is the smallest thing I could do to this system to push it in the right direction? And then you run the system and you look at it again. And then you ask, what's the smallest change I can make next that would push the system in the right direction? And then you run it again and then you ask the same question again. What is this sounding like? You ever heard a red-green refactor? I said, if you do that, you will be able to build better software in 10% of the time. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> You've got to have a running system all the time to do this. You've got to build multiple times a day. You've got to test that system multiple times a day. You need the red, green refactor. <laughs> That needs to be your bread and butter. But how many of you are, have that environment? Nobody, somebody, one. Boy, things, are, things need a lot of work here in Dallas, OK? <laughs> because your competition, <laughs> a lot of them can do this <laughs> in their sleep, OK? The state of the art today is continuous deployment. That means you're continually deploying off your main branch every day. 
And in some of, some of the Scrum organizations I work with now, they're packaging. OK, we're coming in. Agile means Scrum plus continuous deployment. That's what we're training the banks in, in the Netherlands. OK, so we have an Agile solution for this. It's called continuous integration. It's called automated acceptance test driven development. And the acceptance tests are what I just described. This is the second big pro biggest problem in scaling. People want to talk about scaling. They can't do this. I don't know what they're smoking in the back room, but they think maybe safe will save them. Maybe a hardening sprint or <laughs> a release team or something <laughs> will save them from their fate. <laughs> Good luck. As long as you don't have to compete against Google and Amazon, maybe it will be OK. But I was telling the Capital One management today that I'm in Zurich regularly, and they tell me that Google is negotiating with one of the biggest banks in Zurich to come in and take over the IT infrastructure. I said, wow. I said, you know, it's a good thing you guys are in the scrum training, because if that happens, there won't be room for any more waterfall guys left in Zurich. It'll be game over. Okay? So this is a really critical issue. Now, as we got the team rolling, and within six months, sure enough, they delivered so much software they were asked to slow down. While this was going on, we, we were thinking about OK, we're going to deploy a new set of tools that we're building with this approach. And we really want the people using the new tooling to use this approach to delivering the applications. Because you can't build good object-oriented applications if you have a hierarchical management structure. We're going to have to figure out something else. You know, Conway's law says, if you have a hierarchical organization, then you'll have a hierarchical code base. That means it will be brittle, hard to maintain. You'll architect yourself into a corner. It'll be slow. You'll have performance problems. You'll violate every object-oriented principle simply because your organization is the wrong organization. It's not just waterfall. That's why the French say hacking leadership is what this is all about. There needs to be a completely weight rethink of the way our organizations are. The other thing we knew clearly is that small teams are critical. We had data on hundreds of teams that showed hundreds of teams doing the same project. But some teams were small, two people. Some were four, some six, some 10, some more. And what the data clearly showed that if six people took a year to deliver, if you added four people and made the team of 10, it would delay the project with six for six months. Adding more people makes it slower. I won't ask you how many people have more than teams with 10 people on it. How about if I just say, how many have teams that meet the definition of the Scrum Guide, three to nine? OK, so that's better than the other two issues. So, <laughs> But I, I'm thinking that maybe here at Capital One, there might be some teams bigger than that. I just met with the management, and they didn't, they didn't confess, but I, I got the feeling that maybe they had some bigger teams. The third thing that I had actually one of the things I always did when I was managing a manager in the banks, when I, I would train all the middle managers on entrepreneurship and innovation. I used Peter Drucker's book by that name. You know, I said, you guys need to innovate. You need to be entrepreneurial. We need to do things a lot faster. They need to be a lot better. <clears throat> and I knew that where this had been done really well in the Air Force, Lockheed had a skunk works in the California desert. And 
It was all top secret. Management could, couldn't go there. They couldn't know what they were doing. And they could deliver things like the SR-71, the first stealth bomber, in 10% of the time for 10% of the cost. So I said, we need a skunk works, you know, because, and we need to figure out a way. We can't put it in the California desert. How do we put it in corporate headquarters? If we didn't, don't figure that out, you'll never be able to innovate because of what Drucker called the cuckoo effect. Cuckoo lays an egg in another bird's nest. If the other bird finds out, it destroys the egg. If you do any innovation inside a corporation, it's like invading foreign bacteria. The immune system of the organization rises up and crushes the innovation. So the real magic of Scrum has to do with the organizational structure of small teams that scale through Scrum of Scrums. We're doing a case study right now on the Saab fighter guys that build fighter jets with Scrum, two-week sprints. <clears throat> and every morning at 7.30, the, the teams get together, have the daily meeting. At 7.45, the Scrum of Scrums meet. At, seven, at 8 o'clock, the Scrum of Scrum of Scrums meet. At 8.45, the Scrum of Scrum of Scrum of Scrums meet. And at 8.30, the senior management meets to remove any impediments that the Scrum of Scrum of Scrum of Scrums has identified that they need help with. And that includes, that's every morning, okay? So a whole organization, if they run it, really want to go fast, does this. And the teams were learning, my, uh, my son JJ, who really helped writing the book, was asked to meet with General McChrystal's people when they were writing the book on teams because JJ had been the war correspondent for National Public Radio and run reporting out of Iraq for about 10 years. And he was there during the time that General McChrystal turned the war around. We were losing the war and terrorist incidents were escalating out of sight. And General McChrystal said, you know, we got to do something. And what we need to do is have co-located cross-functional teams all together. We need the intelligence, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, the Army intelligence in the same room with the special forces, the SEALs, the SWAT teams. And we need to be able to take intelligence and in less than an hour execute a strike. And when they did that, the terrorist incident started dropping to zero and the war turned around. So in, to do that, they, they needed to form a team of teams. Teams needed to be cross-functional and a team of teams that was like the scrum of scrums needed to be driving it. So that's the best metaphor. So this gets into the third biggest problem that companies have, and that we're, we're starting to talk about as organizational debt. <clears throat> you know, we've talked about technical debt for years, but what is technical debt caused by? Well, it's caused by developers writing bad code. But why do developers write bad code? Who's the developer? Why is, why is there so much crappy code out there? A lot of time it's rushing. Everybody's rushing. Everything's number one priority. Everything needs to be done yesterday. Who's doing all the rushing? What's that? The leadership. Ah, now we're getting to the root of the problem. It's not technical debt. It's organizational debt. And the leadership, the way they've structured everything, is screwing everything up. So if you have, how many have missed delivery dates and unhappy customers? Only a few of you are raising your hands. The rest, a lot of you <laughs> don't want to admit it. That is a symptom of organizational debt, OK? <laughs> and what's the solution? Well, what we found that it starts, we, there needs to be, ideally, would, at, like at Saab, the senior management team would be the executive action team to systematically remove organizational debt every day. But most senior management teams aren't there yet. 
while we're waiting for them to catch up with Agile, we need an enterprise action team. It needs to have senior management representation. It needs to have scrum, really experienced scrum people on it that can do training and coaching. It needs to have middle management evangelists. Anybody else that, need, that is needed to get the organization to done. <laughs> Whatever that means for the organization. So that's the third biggest corporate problem that people have. Now, let's, well, what, we had, what we wanted to do is wrap this up, put a ribbon on it, so we could deliver it to our biggest customers. At that time, the model we had in our head was Ford Motor Company. We had 1,000 IT workers uh, building software, using our tools. We wanted to give them this new process. So we started researching. We read 30 years of IBM system journals started reading hundreds of papers in the computer science literature. The best paper we found was actually not in the computer literature, it was in the Harvard Business Review by Takeuchi Nanaka, two Harvard Business School professors called the New New Product Development Game. And in that paper they had this chart on three styles of project management. Type A was what they saw at NASA. Years of requirements development, then a big document handed off to design. Many years of design, hand that off to implementation. Many years of implementation, hand that off to testing. Many years of testing, many more years of testing. <laughs> Finally, handed off to implementation, years of trying to get the rocket launched. If anything bad happens, rinse and repeat. They brought Fuji Xerox management to NASA and they looked at what was going on. They said, Wow, you know, that must be best practice. They went back to Japan and tried to implement that. They didn't realize that the failure rate today of that process is 89%. So the Japanese haven't been trained by Edwards Deming. They immediately did a root cause. What causes the failure? Big documents and handoffs between solid departments. So Fuji Xerox banned all big documents. We won't have any of them, and all work will be face-to-face. -face. That radically shortened the cycle time and increased the success rate. But the best teams that Takeuchi Tanaka saw were in lean companies, like in this paper, Honda and Canon, 3M in the United States. Later, Takeuchi spent six years writing a book on Toyota. And these teams were working so closely together, it reminded Takeuchi Nanaka of the game of rugby, and particularly the scrum formation in rugby. So they said, we're going to call this type B and C scrum project management. We read that paper, we said, that's perfect. We'll call what we're doing scrum. And somebody on the team said, who will be the, what will we call the team leader? And they said, let's call him the scrum master. So that's where Scrum comes from, lean product development. You know, all these great teams have transcendent goals. They're autonomous teams. They choose their work. They decide how to do the work. They're cross-functional teams. They learn in community how to uh, build their craftsmanship. And in recent years, we've been reading, meeting with the Lean Enterprise Institute that was one of the key organizations that started the whole lean movement. And they have confirmed that, yes, Takeuchi and Tanaka are talking about lean product development teams that they saw at Toyota and other similar companies. Now, this all happened back in 1993. You know, in 1995, I, got to, I called Ken Schwaber in to take a look at the Scrum team. We've already been delivering for two years. I said, Ken, the Scrum thing works, really works. This project management software and stuff you're selling to the big firms like IBM, Coopers and Librem, Ernst and Young, Anderson at the time, said, those things don't work. Why don't you take a look at this? This really does work. And he came in and spent two weeks with the team, and he said, you're right. He said, if, if I use the tools I'm selling to the big consultancies for building my software, I'd be out of business. I'd be so slow. So I said, well, why don't you sell Scrum? And we talked about how we might do it. Uh, we agreed that it had to be open source. And then Ken started to market into industry while I'm working inside companies implementing it. 
In 2001, the, the Agile Manifesto crew was invited to a meeting in Snowbird. And at the time, it was mainly a debate between the three, three guys from Scrum and four of the founders of XP. The other people were almost all consultants, book authors, thought leaders. And we argued and debated for a whole day. And by the end of the day, the only thing we agreed on is we're going to call what we're doing Agile. Why? Because of this book, which is about 100 hardware companies that were lean, and they said, we're going to call ourselves Agile because we're lean, plus we involve the customer directly in product creation. And to do that requires radical changes in organization, management philosophy, the way you do operations, all that sort of thing. So here's, you know, I mentioned Saab. They build the world's best fighter today. Compare that to the F-35, which is the latest generation U.S. fighter. It's it was $143 billion over budget last year. I had two guys from the Department of Defense following along in my, I did Scrum Master training, product owner training, then a scaling course. They followed me for a week and a half. And they had a cheat sheet on their desk the whole week and a half. $1.7 billion project, $143 million billion over budget. <laughs> what are we going to do about this? <clears throat> and this is just our worst project because we got others. So Scrum works a lot better, not only in software, but it really comes out of hardware, right? It's lean product development, which was seen in hardware companies. That's where Scrum comes from. We just brought it into software. Now we're actually, some of the things we've learned in software, like test-driven development, continuous integration, all that kind of stuff, we're kind of folding back into hardware. And so some of the best hardware companies now are, have moved to Scrum, and it's going out into all kinds of other areas. Has anybody run their wedding by Scrum in here? In Silicon Valley, if I asked a question, in this size group, at least six people would raise their hands. There's a lot of weddings done by Scrum today. And I, actually, the, one of the most interesting applications is in education. Uh, the best model was starting in the Amsterdam area. It's called EduScrum. And the bell rings, and the kids run in this into the room, they put up their scrum boards on the wall, have their daily meeting, they run to their seat, they start working, the teacher's just standing there. I asked the teacher, what do you do? She says, I'm the product owners. So I give them the backlog, and, if, and I make sure they're done. And if they have questions, they can ask me. But they never let me talk more than 10 minutes. You know, the days of these hour-long lectures, they're gone. <laughs> I said to the kids, is this more fun than the old way? They said, yeah, we have a definition of fun for everything. <laughs> they, they get a better grades, they complete faster. It's the future. So I only got a few more minutes. I just want to summarize the latest data on Agile. Down on the right, you can see on the left, waterfall. Success rate, 11%. Agile, success rate, 39%. So, four times the success rate. So, we made progress. But look at the yellow. Those are the agile people that can't deliver. They don't have working software at the end of the sprint. How many people have working software at the end of the sprint? It's getting better than it used to be, but there's still a lot of people that don't have it at the end of the sprint. And that means you're going to have problems delivering. You're going to have problems making customers happy. So we need to, that's the major area where I'm working right now is to try to fix the bad agile out there. So we go in and we have a comprehensive assessment we do. We can look at all the pieces. And this is a team, typical, first look after first sprint. The scrum master is trying, but nothing's working. 
we get a good coach in there, a sprint later, it starts to look like this. Wow, everything's going to the green, but still the engineering practices and testing and the leadership is still broken. So then we have to go to work on that. If we do that well, we, we start to get velocity going up like you see in this chart. Uh, this is this, one of the same teams that the first data was done on. You can see our goal is to get over 400% increase in velocity. But to do that, you have to run a really good scrum. Uh, here's here's uh, one of the latest teams I'm working with uh, at one of the a very large startup that's exploding, uh, building cloud-based infrastructure. When they started down on the left, teams were not stable. They brought me in to do, do Scrum Master training for the managers. I said, you know, you guys, you need to fix this. So in the fourth sprint, they stabilized the team. Production immediately went up 500%. How many people have stable teams? It looks like about half of you, maybe more, don't. Wouldn't you like to have 500% more production? Get those teams stable. Then once you get them stable, then they can actually start learning and they, they, they implemented some of the patterns we talked about. They start going up or when you see a second from the last, they implemented one of the patterns we call the interrupt buffer. That's space for handling interrupts. You know, the latest research from Carnegie Mellon shows that if a team has a plan for interruptions, they'll produce 49% more software than a team that doesn't have a plan, even if there are no interruptions. That means everybody's got to have an interrupt buffer or you're going to give up a third of your production right there. And so now, this team is like, how do we keep that going up? This is actually the last sprint. This is the latest data from the very last, the sprint they finished last week. So in order to do that, you can't just run California laid back, guitar playing hippie agile. That's what Jim Copeland says most of that California stuff is. You've got, to you've got to implement what we call aggressive scrum. So aggressive scrum looks like this, you know, if you're on a bike team, can you do whatever you want? You could, but the whole team will immediately slow down. And the guy is in the front is like the scrum master. So I was today, I was asked uh, uh, the management here at Capital One, Oh, some of the teams are de-emphasizing the role of Scrum Master. Do you think that will hurt? What happens if the guy in front stops pedaling harder than everybody else? That whole team is going to slow down. And in fact, if you're running aggressive Scrum and that Scrum Master gets tired, he needs to peel off and go to the back of the line, let somebody else step in and pedal harder. And the faster the teams go, the harder they guy in front has to pedal. <laughs> Resistance gets higher. So aggressive scrum, that's, it's, it's just the same old scrum except it works. <laughs> Instead of the scrum that has no working software. So the book is now going into many languages. This is a few of them. And <clears throat> I have all these and many stories. It says I'm over time by four minutes. Is that right? So I guess I better stop here. <laughs> and I, I think, I don't think we, I still think we still have time for questions, don't we, Stacy? I think we're pretty close to none. <laughs> pretty close to running out of time. Okay. We are. Okay, so I'll turn it back over to you then. Do Great. whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff.